shall not be moved. I shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved on my way to glory land, and I shall not be moved on my way to glory land. like a tree planted by the water I shall not be Jesus is my Savior, and I will not be moved. Jesus is my Savior, and I will not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. be to God, I will not be moved. Glory be to God, now I will not be moved just like a tree planted by the water. I shall not be moved. I shall not, I shall not be moved. Just like a tree planted by the water, I shall not be moved. No, I shall not be moved. Hello, brothers and sisters of Christ. I'd like to start this study out with Standing on the Promises, an old hymn. If you want to pause it and look it up, you can look up the hymn and sing along. Right. Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing, standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing, standing on the promises of God, my Savior. Standing, standing, I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises, I cannot fall. Listening every moment to the Spirit's call. Resting in my Savior it has my all and all. Standing on the promises of God. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of Christ my Savior. Standing, standing. Standing on the promises of God. You say, why'd you choose that one? Because today we're going to talk about stand and prove yourselves. The whole armor of God. And we're going to get into the whole armor of God. We're going to be moving quick, brothers and Christ. Pause it and turn. I've got my King James Bible here. Make sure you have your King James Bible. But I went ahead and printed out all the verses that I want to talk about. And I, as, as normal, I tried to keep it down to a small thing. And the next thing I know, it's four pages long. <laughs> so we're going to be moving, moving, moving. So pause the video, turn to the scriptures, unpause the video. Okay. So we're going to start, we started with standing on the promise hymn. Because we're going to be standing to prove thyself. Stand and prove thyself. We've done a series of studies, Brother Says Christ. We're back out here on the mountainside. We've got Declan right here. Got my water, got my Bible 
Alexander Scorey reading the Bible, and I got good wordless music. I got hymns. <laughs> I got the Word of God, and I'm out here today, and I wanted to share it with you guys again. But we've been doing a series of studies on proving yourselves, because today it just seems like, A, we're not proving ourselves, and B, we're not making the brethren prove themselves. Okay? If anybody says they're saved, they're saved. If they say they're one of us, they're one of us. And, and I don't even have to prove that I'm, I'm, I'm in Christ. Okay, we did a study, if you haven't watched it, Are You a Christian in Christ? Okay. This is almost like a follow-up. I wanted to talk about the whole armor of God, and God got unto me and said, You know what? This is a good way to test to see whether a brother in Christ is still in a standing position and hasn't fallen away, or if someone's a fake and a fraud. So before we get into this, I want to get talk a little bit about standing for this book, the King James Bible, which is one of the pieces of the armor is that sword, right? So Isaiah 64, 8. Isaiah 64, 8. But now, O Lord, thou art our father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, thou art potter, and we are the work of thy hands. What we're seeing today, brothers and Christ, is you've got brethren, or some brethren that have fallen into the trap. We've talked about this, the indoctrination of, yea, hath God said, a better reading would be. And they start correcting this book, or they start saying things, they start thinking they can say things better than the way God said them. Okay. And we get people, you see, that's someone I believe is falling away. And like I said, I've been indoctrinated with it. Brother says Christ, I'm pretty sure you've been indoctrinated with it. And we've got to work harder to say things God's way. Not the world's way. Not man's wisdom's way. The Bible way. And when someone says something, it's chapter and verse. Thus saith the Lord. Okay, then where is it at in the Bible? Okay, where is it at in the Bible? Okay, a little side note. Um... Uh, we put out that video, and some brethren, or some professing brethren, I think a lot of them are fakes, they got mad at me with that study. And all I simply said was, is if you're going to say, thus saith the Lord, make sure it's in here. Make sure the Bible actually says it. And they got upset. They got upset. Why? Because they don't like this being the final authority. They want this to be the clay, and they want to be the potter. No, you're, you and me, brother, says Christ, we're the clay. God is the potter. And this is his final authority. This doesn't conform to us. We're to conform to it. So when you act like you are the potter, and the word, capital W word, and the lowercase w word is the clay. What does the Bible say about people who start acting like they're the potter, and they get this book to conform to them? They correct this book. They add to this book. They subtract from this book. 2 Peter 3.16. 2 Peter 3.16. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their own destruction. Now, brothers of Christ, I believe this is talking about not brethren that are trying to be deceitful. We'll get to that word, to that scripture where it talks about people handling the word of God deceitfully. I believe the scriptures mainly Peter's telling, and I believe first. You have 1 Peter and you have 2 Peter. But I believe Peter's telling us there's, there's people that don't get this. And when they don't get this, instead of doing what we're going to be talking about, if you don't understand something in the Word of God, what do you do? James 1.5 If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that giveth to all men liberally and abradeth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith, not wavering. For he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Brothers says Christ, part of standing is, is this God's perfect written word? Yes. Then you need to follow the true plan of salvation that's found in here. Repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And get truly saved and born again. Then you have the changed life. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Okay, you need to get back to doing things God's way, following 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing. Okay, what's written uh, to us and what's written for us. The whole Bible is written for us, but there are certain commands on how we're supposed to live, how we get to saved, Pauline epistles, how, uh, how we're supposed to live a life of Christ, the Pauline epistles predominantly, but you can get instruction righteousness throughout the whole Bible. But 
eternal security. I've gone through it all before. Eternal security. Uh, the Bible says, sealed into the day of redemption, that you may know you have eternal life. Okay? Um, dispensational. The dispensation of the grace that's given to me to you, word, Paul says. Okay, we learn about dispensations in the Pauline epistles. We learn about the, the day of Christ, the day of redemption, the blessed hope, getting caught up before the time of Jacob's trouble. We learn that in the Pauline epistles. Okay, looking for that blessed hope. We learn about the judgment seat of Christ and so on and so forth. Predominantly, we've got to make sure that we're rightly dividing this. But when you come to this book and you come across something that you don't get, you don't understand, you don't wrestle this to your own destruction. You don't rest. I'm sorry, I had a brother correct me. Rest. You don't rest this to your destruction. You don't try to force... You... Okay, I don't understand what it means. Maybe it means this. So now I'm going to force this to line up what I think it means when I clearly don't understand. I even admit I don't understand, but i got to force this to where I do understand it. Remember the Bible said, Trust the Lord with all thine heart and lean not on thine own understanding. Trust the Lord with all thy heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God that give it to all men liberally and abradeth not. When you come across something you can't understand, you're to ask God, Lord, please open the scriptures to me. Please open the scriptures to me. You are not to force the scriptures to say what you want it to say. That's when we get to the... the you have people, like I said, you have, I believe you have brethren that they don't get it. And they need to be patient. Wait on the Lord. Again, I say wait on the Lord. Okay, You're supposed to be patient and wait. You ask God to open the scriptures to you, and God will open the scriptures to you. But he'll do it in his time. Okay? But you get people, we're not to force the scriptures to say what we want it to say. And you got some people who purposely do that. Who are they? 2 Corinthians 4.1 Therefore, seeing we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we faint not. But have renounced the hidden things of dishonesty not walking in craftiness I've said this before I've seen brethren that I believe are saved they start falling into trying to be crafty they take the word God chose like let's say Jeremiah where it says workmen with the axe and they they change it to craftsmen with the tools it says uh, decked these tr these trees are decked with gold and silver and they change the word decked to gilded and they give the definition of gilded. They give the definition of craftsman. But that's not what the Bible said. And when you try to call them out on it, they'll say, Oh, no, I'm not adding to God's word. I'm just describing what a workman is. No, you replace the word workman with craftsman. You replace the word decked with gilded. And it's not just that. Oh, like Trinity, uh, the word is Godhead. Oh, yeah, I, I'm not replacing the word Godhead. Yeah, Godhead's good. Yes, you are. You're replacing the word Godhead with Trinity. Nowhere in the Bible does it say Trinity. Nowhere does it say um, faith alone, free grace. It says that for by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are created in Christ Jesus unto good works that have before been ordained that we should walk in them, to change life after salvation. But the Bible says it's a gift. It's God's grace that saves, not your faith. It's how you find God's grace through faith. And then it's a gift, and Paul talks about being a free gift. Why don't they say it's just a free gift? Why do they have to say free grace? Why do people always have to grab this book and add to it and subtract from it? They always try to walk in craftiness. Oh, this is the Trinity verse, or this is the... They always try to walk in craftiness. Oh, we're not adding to the Word of God. We're improving. I mean, no, we can't say that because then that makes us look bad. We're correcting God. No, that makes us look bad too. Um... Well, it's just your feelings and opinions. That's just your interpretation. Who are you to judge me? And then they start going through all the, the, the you know, persecution complex. I'm being persecuted for standing for the word of God. No, they're not. We're being corrected by brothers saying chapter and verse. We're supposed to be the Bereans. Not walking in craftiness. We're supposed to say, thus, if you say, thus saith the Lord, it better be in here. If not, the Bible says that... Add thou not to his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. The Trinitarians have been found liars. The so-called free grace, faith alone movement, which is a repentantless gospel, and even a prayerless gospel, a false gospel, they've been found liars, because we can show them liars in this book. Chapter and verse where it says that. It says it's a free gift. And a gift has to be 
given. In this case, it has to be given. Not always, but in this case, it has to be given by God. You can't just take it. It has to be given. And you have to ask for it. I remember a, a satanic Jezebel woman once said, when she had too much, she said, uh, if you ask for it, it's not a gift. If you ask for it, it's not a gift. Declan, get over here. If you ask for it, it's not a gift. Yes, it is. You can still ask for a gift. That was, that was, that was a, a person who hates this book. That's a response of someone who just at, vehemently hates this book. Because all through this book, you have people bet, falling on their knees and asking God for help, begging Him for help. And when God helps them, did they earn it because they asked? No, it's still a gift. It's still a blessing. It's still God showing His mercy. Okay. And they get on to us, we say, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the Word of God deceitfully. And that's what they do. They handle the Word of God deceitfully. See, they'll read... It's a free gift, and then they'll look at you and go, see, that's free grace. What'd they just do? They just add it to the scriptures. They'll read that these three are one and say, that's the Trinity verse. No, it's the Godhead verse. You just added to scripture by saying Trinity. See these verses here? That's the church age verse. This is the, the great tribulation verse. This is uh, the millennial kingdom verse. This is the second advent verse. They keep adding man's wisdom and worldly terms to it and they're trying to do it deceitfully the bible says uh, with good words and fair speeches deceiving the hearts of the simple they do it so subtly sometimes sometimes once you brother says christ really get into the bible and say i love the word of god and i want it as it is and you start studying this book you start reading this book a lot and you get through this book over and over and you've been saved 10 years you look back at these people and it, it's not so subtle they're just flat out adding to the word of god but when you were a babe in Christ, you didn't hardly notice it. Why? The simple people who don't know this book like they should know this book. The Brothers of Christ, the more you stay in this book, and I keep pushing this, stay in this book. Start your day with the Word. End your day with the Word. Start your day with prayer in the Word. And end your day with prayer in the Word. Stay in this book. You should be getting through this book at least once to twice a year. The whole book. It's your reasonable service. We'll get into that verse maybe. I can't remember if I put that down, but I remember talking with brethren about that. Um, you present your body as a living sacrifice, which is your reasonable service. It should be reasonable for you to get through this book once to twice a year if you're truly saved, born again, and you're a Bible believer. King David talked about, Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. Thy words are pure words, therefore thy servant loveth them. He meditates on your law night and day. He meditates on God's laws. His word, night and day. That's somebody who loves the Lord, someone who belongs to Him. I want to know what pleases you, Lord, and I want to know how to live right and be right in your eyes. I fear you, Lord, so I want to do what's right by you. But you got these people that they have, they're, they're dishonest. They walk in craftiness. They handle the word of God deceitfully. But Paul's saying, we don't do this. And he's proved himself. But by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. Now notice what it talks about here more than anything. When it talks about hidden things of dishonesty. And walking in craftiness and handing the word of God deceitfully. It goes to verse 3. It says, but if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost. Receive the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. You have people coming in and they're messing with this to promote false gospels. And you see that today, a repentless gospel. They have to ignore the word of God. They have to pervert the word of God. They've got to subtract and add to the word of God so they can push their false gospel, a prayerless gospel. Oh, you don't have to ask for it. It's just free. You just take it because it's free. I've said this to a, a brother in Christ, uh, the gift, uh, going back to the gift. The Bible says it's a free gift. God's grace is a gift. It's a gift of God. And, and, it's a, and that gift is free. But a gift has to be given. It can't be just flat out taken until it's given. I told him, I said, I have a, a, a gift for somebody. Let's say you, for whoever's watching, I have a gift for you and I put it on the desk in my office room. And you sneak around the house and you, you shimmy the latch on the window and you crack the window open and you, you don't come through the front door like you're supposed to. You come through the back 
window and you sneak in there and you see that gift on the table and you take it and you walk out the window the way you came and you sneak back out. You know what that's called? That's called stealing. Until I actually give you that gift, it doesn't belong to you. It's not yours until I give it to you. When you take something, they always say prayer, asking for it, is, it's no longer a gift if you ask for it. Well, let me ask you this, brother, says Christ, ask you this. If you take something without asking, what's that called? Stealing. And you get here a pulse like all these people with good words and fair speeches and trying to say, oh no, you just believe in your head and you're saved and everything. No repentance, no prayer, no asking God to save you. No changed life is evidence of salvation, even though Paul talks about it times and times again, you need to prove yourself. We did study on this. Prove yourself, prove yourself, prove yourself. Time and time again. But if our gospel be hid, it's hid to them that are lost. And whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them which believe not, lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ, should, who, is, who is the image of God, should shine unto them. For we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves your servants for Jesus' sake. I'm not saying I don't want people to get saved. I want people to get saved the right way. Repentance, having God, repentance towards God. For godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation, not to be repented of, but the sorrows of the world worketh death. Repentance is coming to God. Godly sorrow, sorrow towards God. For what? For all of sin comes short of the glory of God. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that doeth good. For the wages of sin is death, hell, going to hell, the lake of fire. But the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. You have to come to God broken. The Bible says God is nigh unto them that are of a broken heart and save as such that be of a contrite spirit. You cannot skip repentance. But what do they do? They come in and say, oh no, repentance is, in the Old Testament, repentance, when God repents, it's a change of mind. Uh, very, uh, when man repents, it's mostly when it comes to salvation, when it comes to God saving man. When man repents, it's not a change of mind, it's a change of heart. When God repents, it's a change of mind. So they go and they try to wrestle the scriptures. Oh no, us, it's just a change of mind. Well, repentance is just a change of mind, so it must be just going from unbelief to belief. No, it isn't. It's the change of heart. It's going from, hey, I love my sin, I love my wicked life, to now... You believe God exists, you believe that there's a judgment coming, and you don't, you're not going to make it. And that sorrow sits in for your personal sins. I've sinned against you. When you go to the cross to believe in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, you throw the old man at the foot of the cross, your iniquities. I ain't saying cleaning up your life. I'm saying you're throwing your iniquities, saying, this is who I am. And I'm so sorry for it, Lord, because look what you had to do because of me. Look what you did. Look what you did because and, had, and suffered because of my sins. And they try to take that out of salvation. You're dealing with Satanists, pure and simple, complete and utter Satanists. And afterwards, the Bible, First uh, Corinthians fifteen, uh, three and four, it talks about how Christ died, how he died. For our sins, repentance. There's, re there's that pesky repentance again. For our sins. How he died for our sins. And you're not going to have sorrow for it? For what Jesus had to go through because of your dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sins? No, no, no. There's no sorrow. There's no sorrow. I'm, I'm proud of my sins. I come to the cross proud of my sins. Pride goeth before destruction whose God is their belly, whose glory is in their shame, whose end is destruction, who mind earthly things. It's one of those verses that's talking about people who, who are lost. Sometimes they have like a profession of faith. But I get so frustrated, brothers and Christ, because I want to see people get saved. I do. I really do want to see people get saved. People who attack the true plan of salvation, this repentantless gospel, and when they say free grace, we say, well, chapter and verse where it says free grace. Well, there you go again. You're just trying to attack the truth. Well, answer the question. Chapter and verse where it actually says free grace. It doesn't. 
Now, the difference between something that's just flat out free, brothers and sisters in Christ, the difference is I can put a chair out there with a sign, an old chair out there on the side, of the, like on the street corner, and put a sign on that says free. Anybody can just come and take it. The thing about a free gift, a gift still has to be given. And so oftentimes, a gift has to be asked for. There's poor people sitting there with signs. Some are trying to be lazy. You know, if a man doesn't work, neither shall he eat. I understand that. Some of them are lazy. And they're just trying to get free money. But let's say they're really honest and genuine. They're poor. And they've got a sign out there that says, need money for food. Or need money for gas. Okay? They're asking for something. And I come along and I see that. And I give them a gospel track. And I take them to the gas station to get them some gas. Or I run them into Fred Myers. that's down here. It's our grocery store. And I get them some food. Did they earn the food by asking? No, it's still a gift. But they don't want to ask God for salvation. They don't want to come to God because the Bible says this is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Neither come to the light lest their deeds be reproved. They don't want to come to God and ask for salvation because they, they, they're still, they love the old man. They never threw the old man at the foot of the cross. They have no problem with their sinful, wicked life. They try to go off of men's morality. Well, I have my beliefs on what's right and wrong. Instead of coming to God saying, you're the standard of what's right and wrong, and I'm all wrong. All wrong. Oh yeah, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner. We're all sinners. No, you come to God saying, I'm a sinner. God, that Pharisee and Sadducee, that Sadducee beats upon his chest, says, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. You come to him one-on-one, -on -one and it's all about you and your sins when it comes to salvation, when you come to God one-on-one. -on -one. Now, I've already talked about this, but it just gets, I get so frustrated, but I want to see people get saved. Paul's saying here, for we preach ourselves, we preach not ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your servants, for Jesus' sake. I want to see these people get saved. I got saved. I was part of this, the repentantless gospel movement, what they call easy believism. Free grace, easy believism. No repentance. No, we, had, we still had prayer when I was going through, but now they're taking prayer out. But I was there. I'd done that. Didn't save me. No changed life. Then God showed me the Bible version issue. Gave me the King James Bible. Showed me the true plan of salvation. And I've been saved ever since. Why? Because I came to the cross broken. They won't ever do it. Why? Because they don't want their deeds being shined upon by Jesus Christ. They don't like us preaching against their deeds. They don't like us preaching repentance, which shines a light on their deeds, because they got to throw their wicked man, that old man, every aspect of that old man, all their sin and wickedness, comes to light when they come to the cross. And they don't like that. They don't like that. They like the man that they are, but they want to go to heaven with it. So they think they can just take salvation. They can steal it. Okay. The number one thing in the Bible today that's being handled deceitfully is the gospel of Jesus Christ. That's the number one thing. Who Jesus really is is also, I put a second thing, but that goes hand in hand with the gospel. That Jesus has a zero tolerance for sin. Jesus that preached against sin. Jesus that uh, warned about hell a lot. Okay. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Back to this being the final authority. I'm sorry for going off a little bit on that tangent, brothers and sisters. I just, I want to see people get saved and it irks me, the servants of Satan. You're of your father, the devil, and the lusts of your father you will do. He was a liar from the beginning and the father of it. And these guys are liars. And I know they can quote scripture just as easy as I can. Satan can quote scripture. But you look at the life they're living and you look at how much they add to this book and subtract from this book. Remember I've always said when you get into a conversation with someone who professes to be a Christian in Christ, one of us, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, saints, first thing I ask them is, do you believe this book is perfect from cover to cover? Oh yeah, I believe it's perfect. Do you, and then you ask them the gospel they got saved off of. They get saved off the true plan of salvation. Then you talk to them about dispensational teaching in that order. And these false gospel people, that's when you go, they'll say, oh, I'm a King James Bible believer. And then they teach faith alone and free grace and a repentantless gospel. And then you realize they're not Bible believers. 
They have no problem adding to and subtracting from this book as they see fit. And when they get called out on it, oh boy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Back to the word of God being the final authority. For this cause also thank we God without ceasing, because when you received the word of God which you heard of us, you received it not as the words of men, but as it is in truth the word of God which effectually worketh also in you that believe. Remember up here it said, uh, James 1, 5, But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. That includes salvation. If you don't believe this book and what it says about salvation and the way God says we're supposed to get saved today, if you're not going to follow that, you're going to go your own way, you'll receive nothing of the Lord. It effectually worketh also in you that believe. And you got so many people, and I, I, I warn you again, brothers and Christ, we need to work harder to make sure that when we say, thus saith the Lord, the Bible actually says it. We need to work harder on that. I even make some mistakes because I've been indoctrinated by the Babel building system, the yea hath God said, where you say things your own way. You say it your way, that's okay, just say it your way. No, no, no. I need to say it God's way. When a man of God stands behind a pulpit or behind a camera on, on video platforms, they, when they get to talking, they need to back it with Scripture, word for word from the Scripture, when they say, thus saith the Lord. Okay. Psalms 1.1, 1, 1. Psalms 1.1. 1, 1. Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord. And his law doth he meditate day and night. Got a car coming again. He meditate day and night. There it is. He doth meditate day and night. But Jesus Christ, are you spending most of your free time in this book, in a prayer, in fellowship? There's times I've been out here and no cars. Then I come out here, I think it's like, I can't say it's Satan, but there's time I come out here to try to do recordings. No joke. Then the cars just start coming left and right. It's like, I'm out here by myself, no recording. Uh, but I trust the Lord. Meditate it, oh, let's get back to the Word of God. Meditate it on a day and night. Okay, brothers Chris, sisters in Christ. You're supposed to spend your most of your free time in the Word of God. Hiding it in your heart and living it. Verse 3, and he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth his, forth his fruit in his season. I remember that hymn that I like that's called, it's like, uh, I shall not be moved. I shall not, shall not be moved. I shall not, shall not be moved just like a tree planted by the waters. I shall not be moved on my way to glory land and I'll not be moved and it keeps going but I love that song on my way to glory land we're looking for that blessed hope we're hiding God's word in our heart and we're not to be moved stand and prove thyself is what the title of this study is we're not to be moved we're supposed to be like a tree planted by the river of waters this is the truth this is the foundation and I'm not going to be moved I got saved off the true plan of salvation. I saw the changed life. I belong to God. He's healed me. He's the new man, given me the new birth, the new man. He's healed me. He's sanctified me. He's given me a new life. My whole life is 100% about Him. Not like these fakes and frauds you see on, on YouTube, the video platforms, or behind these battle buildings. Sunday Christian or an internet Christian. Just I'm only when I'm online that I talk the talk, but I don't walk the walk. And they can hide. That's why we... I'm going off on another tangent, but like that's why it's desperately we need fellowship. True fellowship, which is house churches. But we're in the last days. There shall be a falling away first, and that man of sin be revealed. Falling away first, which is what we're seeing. That's why things aren't being done God's way. Right. But he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters that bringeth forth his fruit in his seasons. His leaves also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. That's supposed to be us, brother says Christ. If that's not you, you're either falling away, which I'm calling you a brother in Christ, so you're falling away, but there's also false converts out there trying to mimic 
They're trying to be, uh, they're a counterfeit. They're trying to be a chameleon. They're trying to copy us and pretend to be one of us. Who are they? I'm going to talk about the lost. False converts who try to pretend. They use what I call PWC, Polly Want a Cracker. They can parrot what good men of God preached and makes you think, well, they know truth because they parroted. But how do you prove some, how do you prove someone? The life that they're living. The life that they're living. But verse 4 it says, the ungodly are not so. That's how you can tell about these people that when you call them out and say, hey, you have a false gospel because what you're saying doesn't line up with scripture. Hey, you got a false god, the gods, plural, the trinity, because you're not lining up with scripture. And they fight you on it. I don't care. What the, they won't say this out loud, but what they're really saying is, I don't care what the word of God says. I want to believe what I want to believe. The ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff which the wind driveth away. But let him ask in faith, not wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea with the wind and tossed. That was in uh, James uh, 6, James 1, 6. But here we read again, chaff that drive away with the wind, which the wind driveth away. Therefore the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knoweth the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall perish. When you get saved and born again, you want to live right in God's eyes. There's two definitions in this book of righteousness. There's righteousness that has to do with sinless, being sinlessly perfect. There's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There's none that seeketh after God. They've all together become unprofitable. There's none that doeth good, no, not one. There's that righteousness. Then there's the righteousness that has to do with being right in God's eyes. My sins have been washed away, and now I'm living right in God's eyes. I'm doing things God's way. In the Old Testament, your sins were covered, and you're doing your best to live right in God's eyes. There's righteousness that just means that, hey, that man's right in my eyes. And then there's righteousness that has to do with sinless perfection. There's none that's sinlessly perfect. There's none righteous. But when it comes to being right in God's eyes, then for the Lord know the way of the righteous. That's what it's talking about here. Remember 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing. But the way of the ungodly shall perish. The ungodly are, are not so. We are like a tree planted by the rivers of waters. The ungodly are not so. I, I did a question mark, not so. We are like trees planted by the rivers of waters. We just read there, question mark. Ephesians 4.14 says that we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and the cunning, craft, cunning craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, not walking in craftiness, not, uh, but we're supposed to renounce the hidden things of dishonesty, not being dishonest. Every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness, whereby they lie and wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up may grow up into him in all things, which is the head, even Christ. But speaking truth in love. But we're not supposed to be cunning craftiness. We're not supposed to be tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. I've come across professing Christians that one minute it's repentance towards God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confessing both in prayer and ask God to save you. Next minute it's, you know, um, there is no repentance. That's just works. Next minute, they get into a, a cult somewhere where, yeah, you've got to earn salvation. Or, and they're just being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Well, first, you're eternally secure. I mean, the Bible says you're sealed into the day of redemption. You're sealed into the day of redemption. And next minute, no, you're not. Then the next minute, you are. Then the next minute, you aren't. Oh, it's the Godhead's the truth. No, the Trinity's the truth. No, it's the Godhead. Oh, now they're both the same when they're not one and the same. And it's just all these people that are just all over the place. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in him all things. Grow up, grow up unto him in all things, which is the head even Christ. Do you believe this book is perfect? Do you catch yourself adding to it and subtracting from it? How can you stand for this book if you're adding to it and subtracting from it? 
How can you stand for this book being perfect if you're not spending most of your free time in it? If you don't even know it. Psalm 16.8 says, you don't have to turn here, but Psalm 16.8, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand. I shall not be moved. Psalm 62.6 says, he only is my rock and my salvation, the true plan of salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Brothers, this is Christ. So it's a long intro on this one, but this book is perfect and we're supposed to stand for it and we're not supposed to be moved. Now today, brothers, this is Christ, what's, what's God say? How do we stand today? How do we keep from not turning our backs on God's word, on the true plan of salvation that we got saved off of? After living a life of Christ, off of the doctrines, the truth is in here. How do we stand, stand, stand? How do we stand and prove ourselves today? First, you need to believe the King James Bible. Not just in word, but in deed. The evidence that you believe this book is, is absolute truth is you hide it in your heart and you live it. The other evidence I've talked about recently is when I get corrected and someone says, where's that at in the Bible? And I go to look and I go, oh, that's not in the Bible. So I need to learn to say it the right way. That's the attitude of somebody that the works. My work, I need to change how I say things to line up with this book. Not the world. Luke eleven twenty eight says, B said, but he said, Yea, rather blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. It's not enough to say I'm a Bible believer. Do you live a life proving that you're a Bible believer? Are you obeying the commands God gives to the body of Christ today? Are you standing for the true plan of salvation, which is the changed life after salvation? The outward showing isn't water baptism. Now, if you want, if you disagree with me, you, the email, there's an email to the ministry and everything. Uh, you can leave a, a short comment, but you can email me. I can, we can get on Skype. But water baptism has nothing to do with today. Has nothing to do with the gospel today. Some people say, well, it's you don't need it for salvation, which is true. It's not required for salvation because it's not part of this gospel. Water baptism. You want to be baptized by Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit, not water. That's the kingdom of heaven gospel. We want the gospel that's revealed to Paul for the time of the Gentiles. Okay? And that gospel is repentance towards God, faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, confess both in prayer and ask God to save you. And when Jesus saves you, he baptizes you by giving you the Holy Spirit. They say that, but getting back to the point, they say that the, the water baptism is the outward showing. No, it isn't. The outward showing is the changed life. See, water baptism is trying to do away and trying to hide what God says the true outward showing is. The changed life, your life conforming to God's word. He's the potter, we're the clay. That's the outward showing. And that's why people don't, these false gospels and false organized religion claiming Christianity, even ones that claim to be King James Bible believers, the reason they don't want the changed life is they don't want to prove themselves. They don't want the real true outward showing, so they make up stuff like water baptism is the outward showing. Or this is the, uh, or just a professing of faith is the outward. No, it isn't. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Matthew 21, 28, Paul, uh, he, uh, Jesus tells a parable really uh, teaching this point. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. And he answered and said, I will not. But afterwards he repented, happens in the heart, and went, there's the actions. So the repentance happens in the heart, the action comes afterwards as evidence of the repentance. And went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whether of them twain did the will of his father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus saith unto them, Verily I say unto you, The publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. He's talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees and the scribes. Why? Because they were all talk and no walk, and their talk oftentimes went against this book. The Old Testament, the Levitical laws and everything, they started changing things. But they were all talk and no walk. Blessed are they that hear the word of God and keep it. Oh yeah, I'm saved, I'm a Christian. Yeah, but I just saw you at the club last night hanging out with those two women and getting drunk and getting high and foul mouth. 
I saw you doing this and I saw, oh, don't you judge me. Who are you to judge me? There's no changed life. I, I got my free ticket to heaven and I can live however I want. What are you doing? You're dealing with someone who's a false convert, a fake and a fraud. Now, if you came across somebody and said, hey, yesterday evening that's professed to be saved, I saw you, you were drunk last night. And he hangs his head down low and goes, I went, he could say, I went six months without drinking, brother, and I don't know why I did it. It was stupid of me. I gave in to temptation. I, the Bible says, make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. But I did. I let temptation in front of me. And next thing I know, I chose to sin and I failed the Lord miserably. You're 100% right. And he hangs down his head low. God be merciful to me. That's someone I believe is saved. But this, this professing Christians of today with false gospels and everything, they get mad if you call out their sin and wickedness. Which one did the will of my Father? Where's the changed life? The power of the gospel is the changed life. After salvation, he takes you, he cleans you up, and now you're an ambassador for Jesus Christ. Now, just to push that hardcore, the word of God is what's important. It's perfect, just the way it is, and do you believe it? You want to be able to stand? You got to, The first part to standing is believing that this book is perfect. So when you start reading, okay, God tells you this is what you got to do to stand. First is believing that this is perfect. Next is reading it and hiding in your heart and living it. And we're going to get into this. Now, once we have the perfect written word of God, how do we stand and prove ourselves? I really wanted to push that and drive it home. We have to have the perfect written word of God. And don't be deceived today by brethren or false brethren who come in and says, I'm one of you, I'm a King James Bible believer. And their life says, I hate the word of God. I hate the true plan of salvation. I hate doing good. Remember what Paul said, be not weary in well-doing. 2 Timothy 2.1 Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that thou hast heard among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Real quick side note. This is one of the big signs whether you have a good ministry or someone's not doesn't have a good ministry. Are they teach are they raising men up to be preachers and teachers along with them? Or are they a one man show? You're never supposed to be a one man show. Okay? Commit thou to faithful men who shall be able to teach others also. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. What we're going to be talking about now is being a soldier. What prevents people from putting on the armor? What prevents brethren that have taken the armor off from putting it back on? You know, you've fallen. You've stumbled. You've fallen. What prevents you from putting the armor back on? Because we're going to get into the armor of God. Thou therefore endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No man that warth entangled himself with the affairs of this life. First thing we're going to be talking about is what keeps brethren from putting the armor, what gets brethren to take the armor off? The affairs of this life. What keeps them from putting it back on? They're still stuck in the affairs of this life. That he may, that he may please him who hath chosen him to be a soldier. Watch out for ministries where the men have taken off the armor and they're getting so distracted by what's going on in the world. The world, the world, the world. Watch out. The men that, that, that get out there and they're, they're supposed to be in ministry, but they whine and complain about wanting more money. They want to live their life the way they want to live it. And they're not content with food and raiment. It's always the world this and the world. We need this, we need that and world. And they don't trust God. There's nothing wrong with asking, hey, brother, this camera, I asked the brethren, I need some help. I don't have money. I want to get a better camera than, than what I have. There's nothing with asking, brethren, every once in a while. But if it didn't happen, I'm content with food and raiment. I'm not going to bully you. I'm not going to guilt trip you. I'm not going to bribe you into giving me money. I'm not. Watch out for those people, okay? They're so stuck on the world, the world, the things down here. They don't trust the Lord. They're not, con they're not content with food and raiment. They have to have more. They need more. Okay. One thing that gets in the way of putting on the armor of God and getting you to take it off is getting distracted by the affairs of this life. Ephesians 6.12, which we'll get into again later, it says, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. 
Brethren are getting more and more distracted by what is going on in the world where you have no say, no power, no say. There's nothing you can do about it. And they're not dealing with their own life. Walk with the Lord where you do have a say. Paul didn't say to Timothy, preach the world, preach the world, and whine and complain about what's going on in the world and everything. No, he said, preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. In season, out of season. When it's easy, but we're also supposed to do it when it's hard. We might go through some hard times. I'm not one that's saying we're never going to go. But it doesn't matter if we're going to go through hard times when it comes to this is still the same. Our mission is still the same. If the world's falling apart, and it is, we're still supposed to be preaching the word, not the world. Okay. Your life and your walk with the Lord is what you can have an effect on, what you can change, and line up with the Lord and be a servant for Him and being a servant to your brothers and sisters in Christ and loving the lost world by preaching the gospel to them. That you can do. You can make your home and abstain from all appearance of evil free home. That you have authority over. What's going on in the world? You, we don't have authority over that. We don't have a say. God's taking care of that. Let God take care of that. Work on your walk with the Lord. And make sure you're living a life of Christ. Make sure you're loving your brothers and sisters of Christ. Make sure you're there for your brothers and sisters of Christ. Physically, financially, spiritually, praying for them. Our battle is spiritual, not physical. And once again, watch out for ministries that get into preaching the wor world instead of the word of God. They get you distracted. You, you, you're better off trying to find a better ministry that talks about the word of God and does Bible studies, expository studies, subject studies, like we're talking about the word of God and how important it is. And we're, talking, we're going to be talking about the armor of God, what it is and how it proves, how you can prove yourself and how you can prove the brethren through the armor of God. Okay. Romans 13, 12 says, The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Wait, wait, this is Paul, right? I remember getting hit for 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Oh no, people are writing false letters and putting Paul's name on it. And, and when it says there that uh, for the day of Christ is at hand, and, and 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, they're just saying that, and they make up this whole fable. No, here we got it right here where Paul just says the day is at hand. That catching away can happen any day now. Are you ready for it? If it happened tomorrow, what do you need to get done for the Lord today? If it happened today, are you ready for it? That's how Paul lived. That's how we're supposed to live. And when you have a brother that's turned his back on it, I'd, I'd correct him. And if he refused to take correction, stay away from him. At this point, how bad it's getting in the world and people, the brethren have really turned their back on this. Well, I still believe in the catching up, just not the imminent return. Uh, looking present tense for that blessed hope, they're making a mess of scripture. They're distraction. They're distracting the people, the brethren, with the world. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Let us therefore cast off the works of darkness, and let us put on the armor of light. Here's the second thing. The first thing was the cares of this world. The second thing, let us cast off the works of darkness. Sanctification, the changed life after salvation. What keeps someone who's newly saved from really understanding and putting on the whole armor of God is God's got a lot of cleaning to do in your life. And the more sanctification and the more your life is right in God's eyes, the easier it is to every morning to put on that armor of God. What makes it hard? Lust of the flesh. Worldliness. Covetousness. Idolatry. Okay. Cast off the work of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. You have to cast off the work of darkness to put on the armor of light. You know, the changed life. And these fakes and frauds out there with the false gospels and everything. Oh, there is no changed life. What they're saying is you're not able to put on the armor of light. you got to cast off the works of darkness to get that sin out of your life. Get your heart right with God. Start living right in God's eyes. I'm telling you, as a man that's gone through 10 years... You know, when I was newly saved, it was hard to put on that armor of God. There were some mornings I didn't put on the armor of God. Why? Because of sin and worldliness that was in my life after salvation. But over time, God sanctified me. One of the evidences of being in Christ is sanctification, the changed life. And the more God cleans up your life, the easier it's going to be every day to put on the whole armor of God. Especially if you're starting your day with the word of God like you're supposed to. 
and ending your day with the Word of God. 13. Let us walk honestly, as in the day, not in rioting and drunkenness, not in chambering and wantonness, not in strife and envying. Envying. Verse 13. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Wait a second. First he says we're to put on the armor of light. Now he's saying, put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Make no provision for the flesh to fulfill their lust thereof. Why? Because that gets you to take off the armor of God. And it's called the armor of light. You know how so, so many people say, well, I have Jesus. I put on Jesus. I put on Jesus. Do you have the armor of light on? Well, no, I just have Jesus on. Then you don't have the armor of light on because they're both used in, interchangeably here. But put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And once again, I'll quote it again. And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. Cast off the works of darkness. Neither cometh they to the light lest their deeds should be reproved. Sin gets in the way of you putting on the armor of God. Lust of the flesh. And if you're putting on the armor of light, you're putting on Jesus Christ. If you're not putting on the armor of light, and we're going to go through the whole armor of God, then you're not putting on Jesus Christ. Today, things are just words to people. Oh, I put on Jesus Christ. Oh, yeah, I have Jesus Christ. Where's the evidence? Where's that armor? And we're going to get into it, that armor of light. Okay. The other thing that keeps one from putting on the armor or putting it back on once you have taken it off is making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. Luke 9.23 says, And he said unto them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself, and take up his cross daily, and follow me. Why do you pick up your cross daily? Because we fail the Lord daily, even if it's just up here. A brother said it right, said it really best when he said, There's the outward sin that people concede, and then there's the inward sin. The thoughts of your heart, and the thoughts that are in your mind. There's times I think thoughts and say, Oh Lord, forgive me of that, and i got to get back to the Lord. We drop our cross daily, but we have to deny ourselves. Repentance. Pick up our cross. Forsaking whatever, it ca whatever caused us to drop our cross, to take off the armor of God, or failed to, caused us to fail us to put on the armor of God. And we've got to get back to our walk with the Lord. Romans 6, 1 says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How are we that are dead to sin live any longer therein? Know ye not that so many of us were baptized in Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him in baptism and death. The old man is dead and buried. Like, that, like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also shall walk in newness of life. The new birth. The new creature in Christ Jesus. Okay. John 17, 17 says, Sanctify them through thy truth, thy word is truth. Looking at the battery. 1 Corinthians 1.30 But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God has made unto us wisdom, and righteousness, and sanctification, and redemption. That as according as is written, he that glorieth, let him glory in the Lord. We're not supposed to be glorying in the flesh. It's one of the biggest signs of these false converts. They glory in the flesh, whose glory is in their shame, whose God is their belly, who mind earthly things, whose end is destruction. They're the enemies of the cross of Christ. Right. He that glorieth will glory in the Lord, not the flesh, not this world, but the Lord. Romans 12, 1 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What keeps many people from getting saved is the changed life after salvation. They love their deeds, and they don't want to come to the cross and throw their iniquities at the foot of the cross and say, I'm no good, period. Period. They come to the cross saying, well, I like this, so I'm going to hold on to it. And I like this. And then someone comes by and says, hey, you don't need to repent. You don't even need to pray. Just believe in your head and you can live whatever life you want. Yea, hath God said, ye can be as God's known good and evil. You can decide what's right and wrong. No, you come to the cross and throw your iniquities for the cross and say, I'm all wrong. Lord, you're 100% right. I'm 100% wrong. And after salvation... You turn to God, to his book, his perfect written word, and say, Now, Lord, teach me. 2 Timothy 2.15, Study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. 
Teach me. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. Teach me, O Lord. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. Show me the way. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet, a light unto my path. I can go through verses galore, but bottom line, do you believe that this is perfect? Did you get saved the proper way? And then I always throw in dispensational teaching. What keeps many people from getting saved is the, cha is the changed life after salvation. Okay. The new creature. They don't want to be a new creature. They don't want the new man. They love the old man. But what keeps many brethren from putting on the armor after they've taken it off? I've talked about it a little bit. When you're newly saved, you look at your life, and your life is a complete mess, and God's got a lot of work to do on you. I understand that. But sin, lust of the flesh, and worldliness. Okay? Making provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. That is causing a lot of brethren. I've lost fellowship with brethren who, who chose uh, Hollywood movies, TV shows, and video games and anime, and satanic style music, alcohol. Some of them, remember it says, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love father and mother more than me, he's not worthy of me. He that loveth daughter or son more than me is not worthy of me. There's times where people have put in their children before the Lord. They put their wives, husbands have put their wives before the Lord. Uh, wives have put their husbands before the Lord. When God doesn't come first before this flesh and all the lust thereof and the things of this world... You're not put, it's going to keep you from putting on the whole armor of God. And I got ahead of myself, the whole armor of God. One piece isn't good enough. You got to make sure you have the whole armor of God on. Okay. 1 Thessalonians 5 5. 1 Thessalonians 5 5. So we've got uh, being distracted by the cares of this world, sin, lust of the flesh. That gets in the way of you putting on the armor of God. What's the other thing? There's one more. First Thessalonians 5:5. 5, 5. Ye are of ye are all of the the children of light and the children of the day. We are not of the night nor of darkness. Where have we read that again? In Romans. Therefore let us not sleep as others do, but let us watch and be sober. Pardon me. For they that sleep sleep in the night, and they that be drunken are drunk in the night. But let us who are of the day be sober, putting on the breastplate of faith and love. That breastplate is like you putting it on. It's like becoming, you're, that's when you become an ambassador for Jesus Christ. And for a helmet, the hope of salvation. We're going to get into this a little more, but hope of salvation. The helmet that's for a hope of salvation. What does that mean? It's not talking about you getting saved at the cross, at Calvary eternal salvation it's talking about salvation from this life you're hoping for something that you don't have okay what's the salvation the blessed hope hope of salvation that blessed hope when we get caught up when we go home to be with our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ when we get our incorruptible bodies no longer have to deal with this wicked body of flesh that gets in the way of us putting on the whole armor of God a helmet for a hope of salvation nine because some people say just being saved means you have it on. No, it's something you got to put on every day. You got to make sure you're looking for that blessed hope every day. Nine, for God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. Appoint us to wrath the time of Jacob's trouble. We go up before the time of Jacob's trouble. But to obtain salvation through, by our Lord Jesus Christ. In that time period, the time of Jacob's trouble, you have to earn salvation by works. You're justified by works. And faith is on the side. You learn this in the book of James, which is written to people in the time of Jacob's trouble. Verse 10, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. The dead in Christ will rise first, then which we which remain shall be caught up in the air to meet them in the clouds, and so shall we ever be with the Lord. Everyone's going to be part of that catching away, even if you don't live to see it. Everyone's going to be part of it. And verse 11 says, Wherefore comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as, ye, even as also ye do. Okay. What gets in the way? Another thing that gets in the way of putting on the armor of God is not watching and being sober. 
There are things that Satan is doing to distract the body of Christ. You're getting worried about the world. It goes back to being distracted by the world. The cares of this world. It's a distraction. Uh, he comes by and he entices the flesh. It's a distraction. But more importantly, he comes in the body of Christ and he starts sowing seeds of division and gets the brethren to fight amongst each other. And then we got all this drama, backbiting and whispering, bearing false witness, false accusations, and fighting amongst each other. What is that? That's a distraction. Where the Bible says, Paul says, we're supposed to be of the same mind and the same judgment, striving together. 1 Peter 5.8 says, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about seeking whom he may devour. You get distracted enough and you're not watching, you take off that armor. Oh, maybe I don't need to put on the armor today, I'll be fine. And he sees the brethren that don't have the armor on and you're, you're easy prey. That's why we fight against false doctrine. That's why we fight against false gospels. That's why we fight against the Bible perversions. That's why we stand for absolute truth. About seeking whom he may devour, whom resist steadfast in the faith. That's why we preach absolute truth. My biggest thing, brother, says Christ, is if you preach the truth enough, people will know the truth that when lies, false doctrines come around, they can see right through them. The number one thing we need to be doing is preaching the truth. Watch out for ministries that are all about, their whole channel is just about calling out false people and correcting people all the time. Be careful about that. A good man of God is going to point you to this and teach you what the truth is. I knew a brother in Christ who talked about money. How do you teach people how to spot counterfeit uh, bills, money? Well, you teach them to be familiar with the real thing. You teach them how to, to handle the real thing, what the real things look like, every detail about the real thing, so then when a counterfeit comes along, they can spot the counterfeit. Whom resisted fast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in the brethren that are in the world. We're all struggling to not get distracted. We're, we need to be sober and we need to be vigilant. We need to keep an eye out. One of the, like I said, number one tactic of Satan is, yea, hath God said. We've got to always keep an eye out for that. If you lower your guard and someone comes in and says something that sounds nice and know, it, look, it sounds good, uh, I don't have to look it up. Yes, you do. You look up what I say. You look up what any preacher says. You need to be back, check, double checking to make sure it lines up with the scriptures. Okay. And one of the biggest things is when a preacher comes on, a teacher having a teacher having itching ears. Basically, they say something that sounds good, but more importantly, they say something that you like. Well, I like that way. I don't really like this way. I like the way that person's saying. You got to watch out for hirelings. You got to watch out for brethren that start out good and they're falling away. And as they fall away, it's something that happens over time and it's subtle. They slowly start turning on the truth little bit by little bit. And what they do is they end up getting you turning on the truth. You've got to be sober. You got to be vigilant. 1 Timothy 4.1 says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith. Is that you, brother, says Christ? Are you on the verge of doing it? Get that whole armor of God on. Giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. What happened? They weren't sober. They weren't vigilant. They didn't stay in this book. They let distractions come along and distract them from putting on the whole armor of God. And one of the things is the Word of God. You gird up your loins, we'll get into it. And the sword of truth is the Word of God. 1 John 2.18 says, Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. There's a lot of false religions out there with false Christs. Not the Jesus of the King James Bible. They're counterfeits. Are you being sober? Are you being vigilant? Are you getting deceived by one of them? Jude 1 3 says, Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, it was needful me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Do you know what contend means, brothers and Christ? To strive to use earnest efforts to obtain. We contend for the faith. I wanted the truth. The Bible says, buy the truth and sell it not. 
Also wisdom and instruction and understanding. To use earnest efforts to obtain. I've got the truth. And now that you've got the truth, another definition of contend is, or to defend and preserve. I'm defending the faith. I'm defending the truth. And I'm going to try to preserve it. So other people can get saved. So the brethren that have fallen down can get back up on their feet. When I get fallen down, a brethren can exhort me through the scriptures to preserve the scriptures to get me back on my feet. All right. I did that. Proverbs 23, 30, 23. But the truth, by the truth and sell it not, also wisdom and instruction and understanding. So we see that what keeps brethren from putting on the whole armor of God and gets you to take it off, even hinder us from putting it back on. The three enemies, you've got the flesh. Remember? Make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. You've got the world. You're not supposed to be entangled with the affairs of this life who have chosen him to be a soldier. And you've got the enemy. We're supposed to be sober, we're supposed to be vigilant. Because the enemy is always trying to infiltrate us. Oh, I'm one of you. Prove it. Oh no, we, we did away with that a long time ago in the battle building system. You no longer have to prove that you're a Christian. I'm going back to God's way. Prove it. Prove it. Let me hear your testimony. That's, that's another key way of proving. Testimonies. I've heard testimonies, oh, I just, you know, believed, you know, I was in the Babel building and I got caught up in the emotions and I went down and that's what I'm hearing. And I went down and, and I, I said a little prayer and, you know, I, I'm a Christian now, you know, I'm a Christian. No, that person ain't saved. I've listened to testimonies. I've listened to a lot of testimonies. I listened to a testimony of Brother in Christ recently in Europe. And he had, how he talked about how he, his life was lost, how he was lost. He was into sin and wickedness and worldliness and he was just a dirty, rotten, filthy, low down, no good sinner and he talks about it. And he talks about how he became broken. Repentance. Believing in God and that judgment and having sorrow for his sins. How he came to the cross through his iniquities on the foot of the cross, that old man. Believed in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, confessed both in prayer, asked God to save him. And then he talked about the changed life afterwards. And God got this out of life. God, God taught me this truth. God got me living this way. I'm more of a light now to this dark world. And I was able to witness to some people. And, and there's a changed life. That's a good, true testimony. That's a good testimony. Okay. Prove it. What keeps someone from putting on the whole armor of God? We'll say it again, the three enemies, the flesh, the world, and Satan. Watch out for that, brothers and Christ. Make sure that your flesh hasn't got you to take off the armor of God or prevent you from putting it on. Because like I said, it's a daily thing. We're supposed to, uh, our spirit is renewed day by day. Okay, we're to take up our cross daily. We're supposed to make sure we're putting on the whole armor of God every morning when we start our day. We got to make sure we have the whole armor of God on. Every day you make sure you have it on. And these three enemies, your flesh, lust of your flesh, are trying to keep you from putting it on in the morning or making sure you have it on in the morning, getting you to take it off. And once you take it off, brothers and Christ, it's hard to put it back on. That's why it's best to never take it off. I speak from experience, uh, getting into the flesh, getting into world, getting distracted, getting into the world, and being deceived by servants of Satan.